How are you, Dr. Chirag? Good to see you. Good to see you, Sheila. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. It's always a pleasure to have you on. And I know you've been really busy. Mm -hmm. I've literally just got up, but you've been working for many hours there at Stanford. How is it going out there? How are the wards? Are they filling up? It's, uh, it's been, uh, you know, Bay Area is, uh, as you know, California itself is, you know, uh, currently the epicenter of uh, COVID uh, in US and um, Bay Area and Northern California are getting the same hit as well. Not as the, at the same level of magnitude as Southern California or Los Angeles, but definitely a lot of activity. And the de demographics that you're seeing, are you still seeing the same demographic be the elderly population, the immunocompromised people, or are you finding more younger people affected? You know, interestingly, um, we are seeing uh, across all ages, all ages of adults, uh, and um, even adults who are sick enough, who are in the hospital, we are seeing all ages starting 18 and above, um, you know, patients in 30s, 40s, 50s, Similarly, those who are in 70 and, and uh, 70s and 80s as well. And it's interesting because there are times where we see patients who are older, 70 plus, but they are not necessarily that sick. And there are patients who are younger, but they have underlying comorbidities like diabetes, or if they have symptoms which are ongoing for several days or several weeks, and they are hoping to get better, waiting at home, worried about going to the hospital, um, and that delay sometimes makes the younger patients even more sicker. So we are seeing this on both spectrums. Um, uh, there is definitely a lot more awareness about symptoms of COVID, about getting tested, about you know, getting access to getting tested compared to what we saw during the earlier part of the pandemic last year, somewhere between March to May. Um, so we are seeing patients coming in early, contacting us early, especially those with underlying comorbidities or underlying medical problems who are waiting at home, are hoping to get better without going to the emergency room. They are reaching out a lot more than, you know, earlier part of uh, last year. Yeah. What are the early signs that you should actually call and get help? The early signs uh, for COVID, it can be as simple as just having fatigue or just having low energy, or it could be just feeling that I, you may have a lower grade fever or body aches or chills, um, just like any other viral infection or cold that you may have during winter or during a particular season where we see a lot of viral infections. Uh, it makes it a little bit challenging right now for patients and sometimes healthcare workers as well, because sometimes patients around this time of the year will feel it's winter, it's cold, it can be just a simple you know, viral infection, a seasonal viral infection, or maybe flu, and they will not necessarily think it's COVID, but sometimes simple uh, symptoms like having just body ache, chills, just not feeling well, having low energy, or having that possible feeling of fever, those could be the earliest sign uh, of having COVID infection. So um, uh, and compared, to, compared to the advanced symptoms, which could be sometimes start as having cough with a lot of congestion, feeling of this mucus filled in the lungs, having difficulty clearing up that mucus and feeling short breath with your day-to-day -day activities. For an example, you are doing your day-to-day -day work, walking within the house or going for a walk outside the home and you have a little bit of body ache, you feel like you're getting short of breath or winded, taking your usual activity. Those could be signs for possible infection with COVID as well. So symptoms vary a lot. Um, we have not been able to identify risk factors where what particular age group will have what kind of uh, symptoms of onset, onset symptoms, but uh, we have seen them across the board at different degree um, and all across all ages. Yeah. So as soon as you start getting some of these signs and symptoms, it's advisable obviously to, to, to go and get a COVID test. And I know a lot of places now you can, you just phone up your medical doctor and there's advice over the phone. But at what point do you think, okay, this is the time I need to, to call and, and get an ambulance and actually go to a hospital? Absolutely. Um, th this is something that, you know, we continue to increase awareness for patients. Um, and awareness is a lot better compared to last year when we were learning about the SARS-CoV virus, we were learning about COVID. Um, uh, but still, uh, in general, when someone is feeling sick, if it is something unusual, then they usually feel with their symptoms. A lot of patients who have 
chronic lung conditions, chronic heart conditions, they feel tired, feel short of breath after doing their routine activity uh, on regular basis. And that may be their baseline or something they live with with years. But if they notice that they are getting more short of breath with less activity, that's the time to call your doctor right away, your primary care doctor, your specialist, whoever you think you can reach them, whoever you can get the message across is better to get hold of them, discuss with them these days with the access with telemedicine, video conferencing, all the physician across the world, across the US, I'm sure UK, they are able to communicate with patients by video conferencing. I do 30 to 40% of my patient visits a day when I'm in the office by doing video conference. And these are the conversation I'm having a lot of patients. Patients will reach out and say, I'm having this dryness in my, in, in my throat. I'm having this cough, which is dry. I'm not coughing much phlegm, but it's just not going away. It's been four days. I'm having body aches. So best is to reach out to your doctor. You can email your doctor. You can call doctor's office, whatever way you can. And most of the time, the doctor will ask for a, an appointment, most likely video visit, to understand the symptoms, because sometimes it could be just related to a, a, a allergy symptom, especially if you live here in the Bay Area, as you know, there are a lot of allergies. Um, and and that's, that really makes it challenging for patients sometimes, because we see a lot of allergies around the time of this year, a lot of sneezing, a lot of coughing, um, a lot of, lot of just itchy eyes, runny eyes, and patients are worried. They're worried, is it COVID, is it not? Um, but it's best to reach out, no matter what degree of symptoms, what level of symptoms you are having, communicate with your physicians, reach out to them. Um, obviously, if they are feeling that their breathing is getting really worse, they're getting short of breath with few steps or minimal activity, if they are feeling dizzy, lightheaded, having shakes, chills, uh, having blurry vision, if you're having those symptoms, or if you are having cough, which is a lot of mucus coming out, if you're starting to cough a little bit of blood, then these are all the signs that you need to go to emergency room right away and seek care right away because these symptoms can be related to low oxygen levels. These days, a lot of patients have access to oxygen meters. I have a lot of patients who, um, who would buy the oxygen meters through Amazon or online. They are readily available um, uh, compared to last year and they will measure their oxygen levels. And that's one way to do this as well. If you are concerned, you can always reach out and buy, especially if you have underlying lung problems, chronic heart problems, diabetes, uh, asthma, you want to purchase that oxygen meter right now. They are not very expensive. You want to keep it at home and monitor your oxygen level if your symptoms are getting worse than your usual baseline. And if you notice that it's something that is consistently running low, submit at 92% or below, it's a good idea to reach out to your physician, your specialist, and report it to them because sometimes it can be as low as 85 or lower, and then your physician may advise you to go to emergency room right away. Uh, so symptoms can vary at different level of infection, uh, depending upon the underlying health conditions. The best is to reach out the physician, and if uh, the other symptoms I mentioned, if patients are experiencing that or anybody experiencing, immediately reach out for uh, emergency uh, help because you want to make sure oxygen level is okay, oxygen needs to be delivered because that can really help early on. There are a lot of things we can do early on. For example, giving steroids, especially when oxygen levels are low, which is something we have learned compared to last year and makes a big difference in terms of the overall recovery. Uh, and especially when we attack the, and, you know, or treat the patient um, in the early part of the disease, yeah. Thank you. So you mentioned um, measuring the uh, the oxygen in the blood level, and now you know you did say that online you could get them. You put them on your finger. A lot of smartwatches have the oxygen meter. Um, yes. What is the range? You did say if it drops down to about eighties, but is it okay once in a while drops down to eighties? How do we monitor using that machine? That's a question that you know I get asked by a lot of patients and a lot of uh, folks as well. Um, and sometimes it, it becomes tricky because uh, sometimes. Uh, oxygen level dips once below 90 and the rest of the time is fine. Um, uh, there are some things to keep in mind, uh, you know, for uh, all the female patients in general, if you are having, if you have nail polish, you want to make sure it's all cleared up because the, the uh, or anybody who has any kind of, you know, paint or polish 
uh, on nail or or any any uh, any problems with that uh, skin breakdown below the in your finger you want to make sure you select uh, uh, area with a nail bed which is clear there is no polish or paint there uh, you want to make sure you check it at least about two to three times in an interval of at least about five to ten minutes so you make sure it is consistent because sometimes it dips one time and the rest of the time is fine and you know um, it can create a lot of headache and stress so it's important to make sure that you check it at least about two to two to three times. You keep at least about 10 to 15 minutes gaps in between and see what the level is. Generally, if the level is running, starting to run somewhere around close to 92% or below, if that's something consistently running low, then it's time to reach out to your physician. If it's below 90%, then it's already a sign that your oxygen level is dipping below normal. So in generally, now it depends on underlying lung disease, underlying heart disease, but generally the lowest level of normal range is around 90%. If it's below 90%, that is definitely very low and requires emergency use or use of oxygen. Now there are conditions involving lungs, for example, COPD or emphysema or pulmonary fibrosis, where sometimes we feel comfortable with patients having their oxygen levels somewhere around 88 to 90% as well. For those patients, depending upon your uh, your physician that's treating you, you may be okay somewhere between 88% and higher. So in those cases, when you have underlying heart or lung problems, you want to reach out to your physician who's treating you, primary care or specialist, and find out what is uh, what is the range that you should be reporting it to them. But if you don't have underlying heart problems, lung problems, you're healthy otherwise overall, is something to keep an eye if it's starting to dip 92 percent or below and especially below 90 that's the time if it's consistently low to reach out to physician or emergency care yeah and watch you. you mentioned the watches i'm sorry uh, to interrupt uh, that's an important point you brought up because i'm uh, you know hearing from a lot of patients um, who are using new watches which are coming out which are giving pulse oximeter readings and they're actually very helpful i have taken care of some patients a um, uh, few with COVID where their watch reported oxygen levels to be running below 90% and giving them the alarm on consistent basis. They came to emergency room. I have seen them. A few of them turned out to be COVID positive. No prior lung or heart issues as well. So technology is really helping. I think that's that's something we, we, we are very fortunate to have uh, in areas or parts of the world where patients have access to technology, whether it's a watch or pulse ox. It definitely helps in detecting it early and, and it helps us intervene early, um, you know, to, to treat these patients, yeah. Thank you for that clarification. Um, yeah, it's amazing the technology that's out there now. You can kind of exercise, it's all getting monitored, oxygen's getting monitored, so that's great. So that's on our end. I can't imagine what it must be like in a hospital, the technology that you guys have. Um, can you share with us a little bit about the advancements that you've seen? You mentioned now using steroids. Um, are we really getting to understand more about this virus now so that we can treat it better? Uh, yes, I think compared to compared to beginning of the uh, pandemic last year, especially at the time from February until May or June, um, we were sort of in a stage where we were not clear in terms of what will be our first line, second line, third line option, what interventions we should be doing first. Um, and now compared to that, we do have a lot more clarity in terms of treating them. Um, and because of that, we are putting a lot less patients on the ventilator compared to what we are doing during the early part of pandemic. Um, we are putting um, most of the patients where oxygen levels were starting to run low or when they're requiring higher level of oxygen on the ventilator early part of our last year. Compared to that, these days we have access um, and we have learned that if we give oxygen with a specialized delivery, for example, high flow oxygen, where we can give a very high concentration of oxygen with a very high speed. So we are giving high concentration with the faster speed really supports these patients breathing while the lungs are healing, while they are struggling to breathe, that high flow coming in really gives them support close to, close to a ventilator. And because of that, we are able to hold on to them on this therapy for several days. And then we are seeing that we have to put a lot less patients on the ventilator. And by putting a lot less patients on the ventilator, we are able to 
prioritize those patients who really need ventilator, use our ICU beds accordingly, and definitely help these patients recover faster, get out of the hospital faster, and get home faster. Steroids, on the other hand, um, we have some clear idea about what dose of steroid works, what kind of steroid works, and what duration or how long we need to continue that. We have data from multiple countries confirming this evidence, and we are seeing that um, no matter what dose of steroid you are using, but if you are using a particular dose early on, especially when the diagnosis is made, patient symptoms start within three to five days, and if their oxygen level is running low, giving them steroids early on really improves uh, their overall health and they are staying in the hospital a lot less. They are needing ventilator uh, a lot less compared to before and makes a big difference. Um, therapy similarly to antiviral therapy, uh, remdesivir still remains one of the main medical therapies or medications, antiviral, uh, if the patients are diagnosed within three to five days of onset of symptoms, then giving this makes a big difference for them, is a lot more effective. If the diagnosis is done more than seven days, eight days, or 10 days later part after the onset of symptoms, then the effectiveness is not that much. And in those cases, we are not using the antiviral or remdesivir uh, at the time. However, early on, we are still using that. Um, proning, um, proning is something that asking patients or somebody who has COVID infection to have them sleep on their, on their chest and their stomach for up to 14 to 16 hours a day, as opposed to sleeping on the back, makes a big difference. Because when you are sleeping with, uh, on your chest or your stomach in a prone position, that's what we call it, up to 14 to 16 hours in a day, it really allows the back of the lungs, which are normally supposed to be down when you sleep on your back, to open up. And that's where we have learned that SARS-CoV, uh, COVID virus really affects the lungs, the lower part of the lungs, the back of the lungs. So by sleeping on the chest, sleeping on the uh, belly, abdomen, it really allows those lungs in the back, those parts of the lungs to have more rest, allows it to open up. And these patients will recover a lot more faster. It's unbelievable. So all these patients, when they come in, we quickly, our nursing staff have a policy, have an order set um, that is automatically ordered and built up for these admissions. We have built uh, what we call as order sets. As soon as these uh, patients are admitted, a doctor will click a few buttons and will go in in the system. Nursing staff will get those orders and they will discuss the patients, inform them what proning means, how they need to do it. Um, and they will explain to them. Patients will start doing them. Um, and again, we are using technology access. We have you know, a lot of these rooms with cameras, with audio and video access. So even though we cannot go to every room at the same time, at the central monitor station, we'll communicate with these patients and, and tell them how they are doing, uh, doing proning, how they are, they are doing it properly. We are encouraging them to do it as much as possible. Uh, but these things are something early on that we do right away from the get-go compared to before. And we're able to treat patients a lot more faster and, and a lot more effectively, absolutely. So would it be advisable if you are getting the early signs of COVID to actually start sleeping that way at home, um, just start laying on your front? Yes, uh, I think yeah, you're in a great point. And that's something um, I would advise to a lot of patients who are not sick enough to come to the hospital, but they are infected with COVID, they are having symptoms. So we will definitely encourage them to do that at home. Um, we'll uh, email them or send them videos, pictures, um, ask them to look on the internet. Um, and uh, uh, amazingly, uh, patients are, uh, um, uh, um, are, are very compliant with this. They, they do this at home and, and they feel the difference. I'll see the email from them two or three days later. Hey, I started sleeping, sleeping on my stomach and I'm, I'm coughing less. My breathing is getting better. It's amazing. So um, as, as simple things like this making a big difference. So yeah, anybody who is, um, um, uh, who is infected or who is COVID, uh, suffering with COVID at home or their loved ones, uh, they will definitely encourage to do this at home as much as possible, as long as they can do it safely. Now, there are some patients who are not able to do that. Again, patients with chronic heart and lung conditions, sometimes sleeping that way will make their breathing worse. Or sometimes uh, they have had surgeries done on the front of their chest or front of their abdomen, their belly, 
that uh, will not allow them to do that. So there are limitations. Um, uh, uh, older folks, uh, especially those with some mental disabilities, some dementia, have difficult time understanding and doing it. So in those cases, uh, we try to do it in the hospital with nursing assistants because we have resources. But at home for those, those patients, you want to be careful because sometimes that can make their breathing worse. And if they need to turn back on their on their back, it may be harder unless they have support. But as much as possible safely, it's definitely something to do at home. Yeah. Thank you for that. So Dr. Chirag, we had a question coming in and it said, what are the typical symptoms of low oxygen levels? Um, I think that's a, that's a really good question. Um, uh, and uh, I think it's something that we need to share with more patients and, and more people uh, overall. Um, the first uh, sign of low oxygen could be as simple as just feeling little lightheaded or dizzy. So compared to your normal health, whether you are sitting, whether you are just resting or walking, it, you may feel a little dizzy or lightheaded. Sometimes you will have uh, a view of your vision being blurry. This could be the earliest signs. Uh, sometimes patients will have uh, an episode where they will basically feel dizzy and they will almost feel like they are going to fall. Um, sometimes you will notice that the skin color will start changing. The areas where color can change first is to look for is the fingertips as well as the lips. It may start looking a little bit bluish and little, start looking a little bit less reddish depending upon the degree. You may see there is a lighter blue or darker blue uh, color change in the lips and the fingertips and the toes. Uh, sometimes you see this tiny, tiny red spots we call as petechia, which are seen in the at the tips of the finger or toes. Uh, these are some so usually we see when oxygen level is very, very low. Um, however, these are the things that you can definitely see. Other things to watch for is increase in the breathing. The number of times you're taking breath goes faster. You feel like you have to breathe faster to do just normal walking within the home or doing your day-to-day -day activities. Sometimes you feel like your heart is beating faster. You may start feeling that pounding of your heart because remember when the oxygen level starts dropping, the heart and the lung are trying to compensate to squeeze in every drop of the blood to all the parts of the body. So heart is gonna start beating faster. You're gonna feel like you're trying to breathe faster because you wanna inhale, get more oxygen in your lungs and deliver to all the organs. So these are all the signs that oxygen level might be running low or starting to dip lower, yeah. And how soon does this happen? Do you have, t um, like, does it happen quite drastically or do you have kind of time to get help or? Yes, it depends on the degree of the drop. If the drop is ha and drop is happening intermittently, if it's happening for a few times a day, then you may not notice these symptoms uh, uh, at the time other than feeling a little dizzy. But if it's consistently running low, then you're talking these symptoms starting within a few minutes. And especially feeling dizzy or lightheaded or color change in your toes or your, uh, your fingers or, or your lips. And then eventually, few minutes longer, you'll start noticing that you're starting to feel short of breath, your work of breathing or your respiratory rate or your, your breathing faster, or your heart will be starting to pound or you'll be having some palpitations as well. So consistently, uh, if the level is running consistently low, these symptoms will continue to be ongoing every few minutes, it will start increasing. If it's dipping a few times a day, not consistently running low, then it might be just a little lightheadedness or dizziness. Got it. What concerns do you have, Dr. Chirag, with the long-term effects of uh, COVID-19? Um, I know they're doing a study right now with about 32,000 people with the long hauler syndrome, they call it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, this is something that um, I think we, we are preparing ourselves as physicians to, to deal with uh, down the line for several years to come because um, we are beginning to see a lot of patients with um, chronic issues have, after having COVID infection, um, especially those who are those who have been through the phase where they were sick enough to be in the hospital um, and uh, requiring oxygen or a ventilator or high flow oxygen. Um, uh, they are going through inflammation inside the lungs, and inflammation is basically the virus. Um, doing the damage to the lungs, 
the virus then dies eventually. However, the inflammation inside the lungs continues. So we call it pretty much an inflammation cascade with different, different uh, parts of our lungs trying to react and that reaction sometimes keeps spreading. So with that, there is a healing phase that eventually occurs, which is good news. And inflammation eventually goes away for most of the patients, unless it's severe enough that it affects a lot of a part of the lungs. And then sometimes when the inflammation heals, it can leave a scar. So when the scar is there, that part of the lung kind of can be a source where patients will continue to have some, to have some symptoms um, and pretty much a lot of patients I'm seeing after three, four, five, six months after they had COVID, um, they're pretty much having symptoms like someone who will have symptoms with asthma. They're having cough, they're having wheezing, they're having trouble breathing or shortness of breath. And this is something that they have never experienced throughout their life. Um, and um, they will they are continue to have those symptoms ongoing up to six to eight months. Um, good thing is that these symptoms are treatable in most of the patients. Uh, we are learning, uh, you know, in terms of doing testing for these patients. A lot of these patients, if they have ongoing cough, shortness of breath and wheezing that happens, we will do testing in terms of getting a chest X-ray, sometimes a CAT scan or CT scan. We'll do a breathing test called pulmonary function test to assess their lung function, which tells us what parts of the lung and uh, overall um, uh, how much of the damage is there in the lungs, and then we'll treat them with different inhalers, which could include medications to keep the different parts of the lungs or bronchioles stay open, or it could have a little bit of a steroid in it to help the inflammation. And I'm happy to share that a lot of these patients, when we treat them, are responding to treatment, they're feeling better, and eventually able to, uh, able to get off the treatment. There is a few of them, I would say so far about 10% from what we have seen, continue to have ongoing symptoms. Um, I have a few patients that have had these symptoms uh, uh, beginning of the last year, and they are still having ongoing symptoms that we are seeing. Um, the large clinical trials and studies are still being done as we are following these patients. So I'm sure we will have more data coming out, which will tell us more about the common symptoms. We'll be able to identify a particular age group, particular under, underlying lung or heart conditions, and then we'll obviously get more data about treatment. But as of now, we don't have a lot of data since we are still um, uh, waiting for studies uh, for patients who have been through COVID and how they are evolving over six, eight, or uh, 10 months or a year. Um, but we are seeing consequences. And I think this is something we will continue to see over the next few years. Um, it is a little bit challenging for patients who have already underlying lung disease, for example, COPD or emphysema, pulmonary fibrosis or asthma, where um, if they have infection with COVID, SARS-CoV, um, their symptoms unfortunately will continue to get worse and their recovery time is a little bit longer. However, for those with healthy lungs to begin with, recovery is faster and we are seeing them to get better. Yeah. Well, when you talk about scarring of the lungs, um, do these scars eventually go away? Um, Again, a lot is something we are going to learn over next uh, you know, few years once the, we see the data, since we are still close to about a year out since the time we have started to recognize um, uh, SARS-CoV and in infection. Um, scar generally in the lungs, if you look at the data, historical data from patients uh, with flu or pneumonia or pulmonary fibrosis or COPD and emphysema, all these conditions include inflammation in the lungs. And all these conditions will lead to scarring in the lungs. Um, this is similar level of scarring that we are seeing. However, we are seeing it a, a little bit of a higher magnitude in some patients with SARS-CoV uh, or COVID. Um, and, um, uh, but there, all these conditions when the scarring happens, generally there is some scarring that is left and that does not go away. Now at the same time, there are therapies being developed for scarring in the lung uh, um, and for targeting the scarring process in the lung, which involves a little bit of uh, uh, a little bit of treatment for patients with pulmonary fibrosis as well as COPD. So once these therapies come out, we'll be able to apply the same down the line for scarring related to COVID as well. 
But uh, unfortunately, if the scarring happens, then generally a portion of the scar will remain in the lungs. Uh, and that part of the lung function, unfortunately, is, uh, is something that a patient will lose. However, lungs have the capacity to do regeneration. And we see that with a lot of our patients with chronic lung disease, severe COPD, severe emphysema, pulmonary fibrosis, a lot of these patients already have 60% or 50% lung capacity to begin with, um, and they will be able to compensate with the 50% of healthier lungs they have with a little bit of oxygen, and um, uh, we see them uh, see them living for decades and even longer. Uh, so um, uh, uh, scarring does not mean that that's the end. Uh, the lung has the ability to regenerate uh, and can compensate and can overcome the scarring, but this is something we have to closely watch. So those patients who have scarring will get CT scan uh, on them on six months or yearly basis. We'll monitor the parts of the lung uh, which has scarring. These days we can get high resolution CAT scan which will give us up to half millimeter images of cuts in the lungs which will give us a really high resolution image and we'll be able to monitor them and see if the scarring is progressing faster. So in those cases we'll intervene by treating them with steroids or other medications. Uh, when the scarring is not progressing um, stays where it is, then we'll just watch closely. And after a few years, we'll stop monitoring because generally if it doesn't progress over two years or three years, then, then at that point, uh, most of the data we have seen uh, scarring will not pro progress anymore. And then we stop doing scanning and further uh, imaging. Yeah. Are you seeing other organs affected long-term? Uh, we are starting to, uh, just like lungs, heart is another one. Um, patients who developed um, uh, uh, irregular heart rhythm issues or heart rhythm issues when they are suffering with COVID um, uh, can have something what we call as uh, cardiomyopathy or damage to the heart, which is similar or close to congestive heart failure. Fortunately, the proportion of patients suffering this damage is very, very, very low. Uh, so we are not seeing all of those patients, fortunately, but it can happen. And in those cases, again, we'll treat this patient just like someone who has heart failure or congestive heart failure uh, and monitor them closely. Um, we are also seeing a long-term effects for patients who have been on ventilator for days or weeks sometimes, because when they are on ventilator, they will go through what we call a sedation, where we have to keep them up to some degree of sedation so that they will not struggle and they will not fight with the ventilator. The lungs will get time to heal, which is something we need to do. And sometimes with that, these patients will have some neuromuscular in terms of weakness of their um, uh, arms or legs when they recover and have to go through intense rehab, physical therapy, uh, and most of the patients are able to recover and regain the strength. However, there are some patients who are uh, left with what we call as critical illness neuromyopathy. So when they are sit in ICU on the ventilator for days and weeks, they have lost that muscle mass, they have lost their nerve and muscle function because of lack of ability to move, walk, and they will have longer recovery period. Um, and sometimes uh, some degree of loss of those uh, a, loss, a loss of those functions. However, the proportion of patients seeing that as well is very low, um, especially for those patients who recover faster within few days or few weeks. But if they are on ventilator for you're talking about uh, three weeks, four weeks or longer, then they have a higher risk of having this. Yeah. We're getting quite a few questions. So I'm gonna make sure we have some uh, question time at the end. Um, mm -hmm. This is such a great topic and, and a lot of people are getting such valuable um, information and knowledge. Thank you so much. I know you're, you know, you're very busy. So, so I just wanna say, I really appreciate the fact that you're taking your time out of your, um, your day to, to answer these questions for us. No problem, you're welcome. I do want to talk about what can we do at home? Um, you know, we know there are risk factors such as obesity. What, what kind of advice would you give the general public about building up their bodies to be stronger, to have a better immunity? Um, I think, um, you know, lung health in general um, has a lot of, lot of impact um, with weight overall. Um, if you look at the, if you look at the breathing, um, the chest cavity uh, is separated from the abdomen, the belly with 
a large muscle, which is diaphragm. Diaphragm is the main muscle that really pulls the lungs down when we take that breath in. It's the diaphragm that really contracts like your other muscles in the body, and it pulls the lungs down, allowing the pressure to be a lot more negative from outside, and the air or oxygen that we breathe in will go in uh, after, after that contraction of diaphragm. And the diaphragm function is dependent quite a bit on uh, obesity and especially obesity around the, around the abdomen uh, and the belly. So those who have uh, obesity, higher BMIs, especially when they're higher than 30, every five after that, 30, uh, 35, 40, um, the diaphragm function can be affected by that. So what it will do is when you are trying to take that breath in, there are portions of, of the lung, especially the lower parts of the lung and the outer parts of the lung will not get that stretch the diaphragm will, will do and they will not open up. So you pretty much have a healthy, healthy lung, um, but there are portions which will not, not be able to participate in getting oxygen in because it's not able to open up. So losing weight in these patients makes a huge difference because then diaphragm will be able to function at the highest capacity and you'll be able to open those lungs um, quite a bit. Similarly, weight makes an, a huge uh, weight gain, unfortunately affects uh, common lung conditions that we see like asthma. We have a lot of evidence starting from evidence among kids as well as adolescents, uh, adults, older adults, um, that losing weight improves asthma control. Millions and millions of people across the world suffer from asthma, uh, whether it's childhood asthma or they're developing a later part of their life. Um, and they are having difficult time with getting different medications, whether they are tablets, whether they're inhalers. These days we do procedures inside the lung to kind of open up the airways with asthma as well, called bronchial thermoplasty. Uh, we are doing a lot of um, a different shots called immunotherapy uh, for asthma, targeting a particular risk factor. However, when their obesity is a factor, especially when BMI or body mass index is higher than 24 or 25, um, asthma control is difficult. We have seen that in multiple studies across the world. Um, I have seen many patients. I really encourage my patients when they're struggling um, and their uh, asthma control gets better, their breathing gets better. Uh, similar applies to other lung conditions as well as other heart conditions. Similarly applies to diabetes. Um, so um, weight is weight is one of the one of the areas where not only it improves the heart health or blood pressure control, but it's a huge huge factor uh, for lung health. And I mean I cannot emphasize enough. I encourage every patient, everybody, uh, to do whatever is possible, whether it's diet, exercise. These days, I know uh, the access is limited to going to a gym or a health club. Uh, but you can uh, use you can use uh, you can use YouTube. You can use online access. Um, you can get diet plans, meal plans. Uh, there are some patients that have uh, already, unfortunately, chronic heart and lung conditions, uh, and they have done what they could to lose weight. And then sometimes we are referring them to a bariatric surgery these days, uh, which will help them lose weight. And we have seen improvement in their lung function following that as well. So um, a weight loss makes a big difference, no matter what age, no matter what underlying heart or lung conditions, um, uh, big, big difference. So I'm a big, a big proponent for that. I'll encourage everybody to do whatever they can and you know, and ask for help, ask your doctors, ask for uh, advice, uh, whatever's possible. And it's difficult. Uh, I see a lot of patients who have done that. They try that. It's not easy, unfortunately. Um, it's a struggle. But, uh, but I will encourage uh, everybody to push as much as they can and ask for help, yeah. Well, what about um, any vitamins, any, any things else that we, we can do to, just to get ourselves healthier? We, we have seen a lot of data over decades uh, coming out on different vitamins uh, for um, uh, different parts of our uh, health systems, uh, our, our body systems. And, um, a lot of data coming out uh, lately, especially on vitamin C and vitamin D. Um, there is a substantial data out there uh, in terms of using vitamin D uh, with uh, multiple different uh, small studies across, uh, across the world 
um, and how it can improve lung health. And um, similarly applies to heart health as well. Um, a lot of studies out there supporting the same evidence for heart health. Um, for lung health, uh, vitamin D has been found to be helpful in patients who have underlying lung problems, whether it's asthma, emphysema, COPD, pulmonary fibrosis, or if they are taking in general to keep lung, lungs healthy without any underlying uh, um, lung problems. Um, a lot of these studies are small studies. They come from um, a lot of centers across the world. We are still waiting for one large good study um, in terms of including multiple centers at the same time and uh, seeing that. Um, however, uh, these studies are not easy to do because uh, you have different doses of vitamin D available. Every small study is done with a different dose. Uh, so uh, it is difficult to kind of put one across the board. And uh, But we will be seeing these studies down the line. I think um, more focus is uh, coming towards doing what we can to keep our lungs healthy, especially after COVID pandemic. And I think more focus is going to come on what can we do to prepare our lungs to stay healthy for any possible viral or bacterial infection down the line and do our best. Uh, similar data is out there for vitamin C as well. Uh, there is some data for using vitamin C um, uh, in terms of uh, patients with COVID um, uh, as well as to use it to keep uh, lungs healthier. Uh, it works as an antioxidant. It has been shown to uh, help improve immunity. Uh, similarly, just like vitamin D, uh, the evidence in terms of one large study uh, looking at uh, uh, for prevention purposes, it's still not there, but there are so many multiple studies out there uh, and there are no so far studies showing any major harmful effects unless you are taking uh, these in excessive amounts. So that's something you want to be careful and you always want to consult your physician, uh, your specialist when you're taking this in terms of whether it's safe for you. Uh, there are patients who have underlying GI or um, uh, gastric issues, whether they have underlying gastritis, underlying gastric ulcers. So in those cases, taking particular medications is something you want to be sure taking with your primary care doctor or gastroenterologist. But in general, um, uh, this is something that has been shown to be helpful. Yeah, but more studies to come to uh, confirm this at a large scale. Yeah. Thank you so much. I know we're, our time is coming to an end and I know you have to get back to see your patients. We just have a few questions. Uh, one question was, are there any exercises that you recommend, uh, for example, pranayam in yoga? Um, uh, there are, um, there is uh, some literature available um, uh, and actually a lot of literature uh, available in terms of improving the um, uh, diaphragm health. Uh, and uh, especially this is something we uh, use for a lot of our patients who go through pulmonary rehab. So pulmonary rehab is a program that we offer to up to six to eight weeks for patients who have underlying chronic conditions, for example, COPD, asthma, um, uh, interstitial lung disease, pulmonary fibrosis, or pulmonary hypertension. And we have learned from this uh, data that patients who go through intense exercises to improve their breathing techniques, deep breathing, um, using their accessory muscles for breathing, which are the neck muscles, as well as learning deep breathing to improve the um, uh, diaphragmatic breathing. Uh, and yoga and pranayam has some data as well uh, in our pulmonary rehab program. We do have a yoga instructor who comes and, and helps our patients learn deep breathing uh, because there is evidence available that it improves uh, their overall um, uh, diaphragmatic function and as well as uh, adds to the data we have for those patients who go through intense rehab six to eight weeks their ability to walk longer, their ability to um, using less of their medications, inhalers, and then them needing less hospital care down the line and having faster recovery. So absolutely, um, uh, it's one of the exercises that will help deep breathing, improve diaphragmatic breathing, um, and maximize the lung function. Yeah. Great. I'm so glad that we're incorporating the Eastern medicine with Western medicine. Um, Dr. Chirag, you did take the vaccine recently. How, how did that go? I just took my second dose, Pfizer, yesterday, actually. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, my, my arm here is a little sore uh, last night. Uh, I took it around noon yesterday. So 
it's about it's a, it's going to be it's going to be 24 hours in the next uh, next three hours. Uh, so far, so good. Um, you know, I had uh, minimal minimal soreness from after my first dose when I took it uh, three weeks back. Um, was a lot less than the uh, flu shot that annually I do. And yesterday was a little bit more sore. Yesterday evening, um, uh, uh, I'm on call this week and I couldn't do my golf game. So I'm not, I'm not too sad. I was worried I won't be able to play, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, uh, no, but overall, uh, I'm not so bad. I haven't had to take any pain medications. I uh, just tried to avoid sleeping on this side last night. Uh, but right now, it's just, just minimally sore, but um, so far so good, yeah. Um, uh, I know I have a few friends, few colleagues, and, and some data we have seen having some reactions, but um, yeah, most of them I would say have had similar level of sim uh, similar experience that I've had, yeah. So I would, I would uh, I encourage everybody, I cannot emphasize enough. Um, I know in US we are, we are, we are really pushing for it. Uh, we are really fortunate uh, um, all over the world, US and UK and, and Europe that we have access to, access to the vaccine. Uh, you know, companies are, and scientists, uh, I, I cannot thank them enough, uh, Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, Oxford, for working hard at this um, uh, to get this done so quickly and efficiently um, and uh, then producing at a mass level and and getting this done, uh, we are very fortunate to have access uh, to uh, you know uh, millions of doses, and uh, it cannot wait for everybody to get vaccinated. Um, uh, encourage everybody as much as possible. As soon as you get access, uh, please please take the vaccine. Um, that's the only way we'll move forward. Um, and uh, um, I cannot emphasize enough. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Any last words? I know you talked about the vaccine. Any. Any words of encouragement that you can tell our audience as far as kind of staying safe? Yeah, I, um, I, I, I think overall, um, just like to end with the fact that, uh, you know, um, we still have to continue to remain safe after taking vaccine. Um, uh, I, as soon as I'm done with this talk, I'm on call this weekend, I'll be putting my mask and my shield on, even though I had my second dose yesterday, all of us across the hospital, all the healthcare workers will continue to take precautions, whether it's masks, whether it's face shield, gloves, gowns, uh, similarly maintain our distance as well. Uh, so we have to make sure we continue to do good hand hygiene, continue to keep, uh, you know, uh, keep, keep our distance for uh, a safety, uh, making sure we wear masks uh, because it is something we have to continue to do. It's a duty and responsibility for all of us uh, and uh, uh, encourage uh, everybody uh, to get the vaccine as soon as they can. Uh, please remember uh, to report to your physician the symptoms we discussed earlier today, whether you want to reach out uh, to them via messaging or calling them or rush to the hospital for the symptoms we discussed. Do not delay the care because early intervention, as, as we discussed earlier, can make a big difference. Um, and uh, and uh, this is this is a uh, you know this this is a this is going to be a good year. Um, we are we we are starting to vaccinate as many as possible. We have a lot more better understanding. Uh, so um, uh, we will get over this. We just have to hang in there um, uh, this year. Just just got, everybody's got to do their part, and and we will we will come through. There's no question about it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Chirk, for your time. Um, that was just an amazing session. I know we're going to have you on again soon because you always have such a wealth of knowledge for us. So thank you and, uh, and go back and, uh, and help heal all those people out there. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.